Welcome back to Course Correction Radio, my friends. Um, and you can also be watching at least clips of this now on Course Correction TV, our new YouTube channel where all of our um, video clips are going to go for YouTube. Now, in the future, once we get everything worked out, you should actually be able to find the whole show over on Rumble or something like that. But we're trying to get away from the YouTube stuff. However, the whole show will be uploaded through Spreaker and shared to YouTube, and that will be a premiere, as always. That's what you're listening to right now. Um, did just want to let you know, if you are interested in the video format, make sure you head over to Course Correction TV. Link is in the show notes. So, let's talk about reaping and sowing. Now, we have all at some point heard somebody say, you reap what you sow. Or a variant of it, such as what goes around comes around. And 2021 is proving that to be 100% true. Now, there are, in a sense, almost too many stories in the news that uh, prove that, if that, that show that to be true. However, what we're going to do first off is we're going to look at two stories. Um, from today at the time of this recording, which is October 1st. And um, at least that's when I read them. Um, that's when they popped into my news feed. So, the first comes from the Epic Times. Um, now, according to this article, which is hyperlinked, and you can find it on our website, coursecorrectionradio.com, first comes from the Epic Times. Pelosi says the ginormous infrastructure bill will be delayed, but according to this article, which is another hyperlinked article, Pelosi is confident it will pass despite the division among more traditional moderate Democrats and their extreme left progressive counterparts. And this is what it boils down to. For as long as I can remember, progressives have been sowing division into the American public. I can remember back during Obama's administration because that's probably when I started paying attention to it, when I had things like current event papers that had to be due in high school, um, U.S. government, things like that. And um, that was right before. I graduated right before Obama's second term. So... But anyway, like I said, as long as I can remember, progressives have been sowing division. So, but let's, let's, let's get into the more recent years. In 2016, they cranked it up to 11 when Trump won the primary. Now, regardless of what you think about Trump, um, you guys have heard me say it before. I have, there's things that I've loved that he's done, and there's things that I've hated that he's done, such as, uh, well, pretty much the entire last year of his presidency, I thought was a colossal and catastrophic failure. I think he relied too much on people that were pitched to him as experts. But you know what they say, the buck stops with you and you're the big man, right? So, I mean, absolutely, with the last year led into that. But that, that's beside the point. So they cranked it up to 11 when Trump won the primary. And ever since then, they have set the lay people up for mass paranoia between Russia Gate, the Kufi, Delta, and... Etc. Now they have people believing the biggest threat to the nation is white conservatives, Christians, and anybody else who questions the narrative. Which brings us to the second main article, and we'll we'll go through both of these, and the links will be in the show notes as always. So uh, this second article is according to the Blaze: forty percent of Biden supporters and half. Of Trump supporters have agreed on something. I know, 
It's the end of the world, right? Biden and Trump supporters have agreed on something. But, at least in my opinion, it's not a good thing. And they they agree that it is time to split the United States. And this is where I want to get into some of my thoughts on it. Because I believe, personally, that this is a sad day. I really do. I believe this is a sad day. A quote that is mistakenly credited to Lincoln says a house divided cannot stand. We've all heard that. Now, for those of you who may either read this monologue, because this monologue is published on our website, as I said, or are listening to this right now, and you are not familiar, that quote was actually Abraham Lincoln quoting Jesus. Um, so, Mark 23... Or, excuse me, Mark doesn't have a 23. Mark 3.25, that's better. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot, cannot, that house cannot stand. Now, Jesus was talking about defeating the kingdom of darkness. In Matthew's account, this is what he says, starting, uh, this is Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 22. This was brought unto him, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom is divided against its egg. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then, will his, then he will spoil his house. And that is Matthew twelve twenty two through 29. So, what is the solution for the schism that we ha- that is happening to our nation right now? And I'm telling you, there is only one solution. And that solution is that we must put Jesus Christ. We must be that. If we're going to be united, we have to be united in Jesus Christ. And if not, this eventual split will only be the beginning of, of our doom. So this is what Jesus says in verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now those of you who have been with us for a while will remember this. And if you haven't seen it, we encourage you to check it out. A link is in it, but uh, if you haven't seen our podcast that we did on the threshing floor. And that was one my wife handled. Did a great job with it, too. If you haven't seen that, check out the link. It'll be in the show notes, and you can find this entire article on our website at coursecorrectionradio.com. So, in the meantime, the best advice that I can give or that anybody could give And if you've ever listened to the cutting edge, then you know what the word of the day is, and it is repent. Give everything you have, everything you have, all of it, to Jesus Christ. Because it's only through him that our country can and will be saved. So let's get into a quick, uh, we're going to get into a quick trailer from our sponsors real quick. Um, well, we were going to, but now it's not pulled up. 
Um, this is from Now You See TV. Now, if you look right over here, we're going to play the trailer for this film right here. This is Dark Covenant, Secret of Secrets. You can find that at nystv.org. Use the promo code, all caps, CCR. Get your first 30 days free. Let's play that real quick. And here we go. this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger and nobody ever knows it. How can kids six, eight, ten years old be describing rituals that come from a book like the like the book of the dead it's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil Make sure you guys check out the that documentary right here, Dark Covenant, Secret of Secrets. You can stream it on nystv.org, and please use that promo code. You will get access for 30 days to all of their documentaries. They've got exclusive documentaries, including Dark Covenant, Secret of Secrets, What If the Earth is Flat, Dark Covenant... Um, what's the second one called? Dark, uh, dark Co- There's another Dark Covenant... Um, plus tons of other stuff. You'll get the Book of Enoch video commentary series. They've got the first two seasons of the Doctrine of Christ, which, by the way, is free anyway. You just need to register with an email and a password. So, guys, please take advantage of that. It helps us out here at Course Correction Radio, and it also helps out the guys over at NYS TV because here's the reality. Channels like this and channels like NYS TV, the Cutting Edge, Truth Radio Show, Big Tech does not like things like this. And these are the ways that you can support us is by by taking advantage of deals like this. You can cancel at any time if it's not for you. And hey, we get it. Stuff like this isn't for everybody. But if you do enjoy Now You See TV's content, then please Use that promo code, all caps, CCR. Get your first 30 days free on us. So, um, trying to get my notes up. So, here we go. Finally. Trying to get my notes up because what we're going to do is we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, as you know, um, we did a rerun of a show that was uploaded to Spreaker, but we didn't do our normal Sunday night premiere, and that's my fault. I've gotten some new equipment in, and when I set it up, everything went haywire. I lost my audio feed, and I lost both my video feeds as we were recording this last time we came. Trying a new um, setup over here. That way I can be a little louder while um, Sarah and the girls are asleep, because last week we were doing Sukkot, and I had basically the whole inside to myself because everybody else was asleep outside. Anyway... I'm rambling now, so let's get into it. If you read this now, some of this is last week's news, and um, there's stuff I've got for this week as well, but I do want to cover what we talked about because this was big stuff, and um, I just want to give a rundown from it because I feel like it feeds into some of the stuff that's going on today. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to read through last week's news, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back for... This week's news as well. So this is going to be a little bit longer of a show. We're not going to do too, too much from this week. Because if you want to catch this week and next week's news, well, you can head over to our... um, We have a podcast now that is... You can find it almost everywhere. It's on Spotify. We're working on getting it uploaded to Apple. We're waiting for uh, approval from Google and from iHeartRadio. 
But right now you can find it on Spotify. You can find it on Spreaker. We will make sure. Head to our Facebook page. We're going to post all the links where you can find it. So head over to Course Correction Radio on Facebook. If you don't like big tech, hey, I get it. You can head over to our MeWe page. We'll have them posted there as well. So this was the first story we had for last week. This is from The Blaze. Watch. White House boots out media boots media out of Oval Office without asking without allowing journalists, U.S. journalists, to ask questions. So, as President Joe Biden met with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Tuesday, now this is this past Tuesday, and it was really the Tuesday before that, so two weeks ago. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. We're we're late on this, but I still want to make sure that we cover this stuff. Um, abruptly kicked out... the. The reporters out without allowing any American journalists to ask questions, prompting the editorial component of the U.S. press pool to lodge a complaint. Now, there's a reading I'm reading. There's a reason that I am reading over this. I promise. And it has to do with a current event. But I wanted to set it up because there's kind of a trend going on. So President Biden responded to questions from two reporters Johnson called on. And Johnson also made remarks after Biden's responses. But at one point, even as the British leader seemed to be speaking, a clamor of voices pipes up. Reporters were shooed out of the room, which did not sit well with American Journalist Steve Herman of VOA tweeted, U.S. at White House press pool immediately protests Oval Office treatment. The dispatch from Radio Pooler at WHCA president at Steve Portnoy, Stephen Portnoy. Um, so there's a tweet there. Always, as, as you know, sources for the stories we cover are in the show notes. You can also find them on our website, coursecorrectionradio.com. So we're going to play a little bit of this so you can hear it. Actually, strike that. This is the wrong video. It said there was a video of this. We were going to watch it, but I guess... I don't see it up there. Um, Oh, here it is. My bad. have him here. He uh, returned a small amount of hospitality uh, compared to all the hospitality he provided for the G7 and uh, our families and uh, and Cornwall. And uh, since then, our countries have worked. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so we can get to the good stuff because this is about a nine minute video. Um, and if you want to in your spare time, feel free to watch it. And we might not even be able to get through it because I can't get the video to actually do anything without I buffering. Want to renew uh, and strengthen our, our transatlantic bond, and, and it feels to me like it's it's going very very well. But I think would it, would it be okay if we just have a couple of, of questions, just a uh, just a just a couple uh, of Good questions for, for the for the, and I think we're going to be ruthless. I'm uh, going to be ruthless. Uh, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to uh, Harry Cole uh, from the Sun. Mr. President, uh, he, he, he asked him the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll take it. Mr. President, is, uh, is Britain still at the back of the queue for a trade deal, uh, a free trade deal? Because it brings us to the last part. Well, that's a nice question. What possible justification is there for the House of Kudas not to be expert to the United Kingdom based just as it has been apparent? Two things. One, uh, that latter case is being worked on. I was under the impression, but I don't know this, I want to be clear. I was under the impression there had been a civil settlement reached, but I don't That's know correct. that. That's correct. And uh, and based on what I've been told, it was it was not an intentional act. It was someone who was new to driving on the wrong side of the road, uh, quote unquote. And uh, but we're following. I'll follow up on that. I I expressed my sympathies when it occurred, 
but I don't know the status of that case right now. The other question was? A Brexit free trade Is it a Brexit free trade Well, we're going to talk about trade a little bit today, and uh, we're going to have to work that through. Let me just say on, on that, Harry, I mean, don't forget, folks, so we've, we've settled the, the, uh, the, the, the Boeing Airbus thing, which was a massive problem uh, between us, and we're making a lot of progress. Uh, to say nothing of the beef, and the whiskey, which I already I already mentioned, and uh, just can I just say on smile when you said the whiskey. I don't know why it's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great ambassador for. But on 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 uh, on the Harry Dunn uh, case, which is a very 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 sad case, and everybody's sympathies are with uh, the family of uh, of Harry Dunn. Uh, I know that the president has been personally trying to uh, to move things along, and, I, and, I, and I'm and I'm grateful for for that. Uh, we're going to take uh, we're going to take one more question. When it comes to doing this deal with the UK, I, there are two separate issues. On the deal with the UK, a change in the uh, Irish Accords, and the end result having a closed border again. And that, that is absolutely right. Uh, and uh, and I, I, on that point, Joe, you know, we are we are completely at one, and uh, I think nobody wants to see anything that. Uh, interrupts or uh, unbalances the, the Belfast Good Friday uh, Accord. That's the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. That's that's the. And there goes the commotion. Now, keep in mind, one of the things that the Constitution allows is the freedom of the press, right? Um, And I would just assume, maybe I'm wrong here, but I would just assume that, um, well, part of, I guess, the freedom of the press is the ability for the press to ask questions at a press conference. But this is what is happening. So we're talking about the suppression of freedom of speech, freedom of press, things like that. Um, And this is why I wanted to cover this story because it perfectly segues into this next story, which is if you have not heard, and I have not actually had the time to sit down and read the updates, but apparently YouTube has updated their uh, terms of service again to even crack down more on the way that you talk about, you know, the jab, koofy, things like that. Um, yeah, so uh, if it could even get worse, it has gotten worse, and I don't know what it is, so um, I'm going to try to sit down if I can, and they, maybe, you know, it'll be, sure, it won't be the most interesting show, but, uh, you know, maybe that's something we should look into reading on the air. Going from there, so... Uh, there is uh, tons of stuff. You know, this was... So this was a story that I got into, um, and I think that this may be the reason that this episode didn't air last week. Um, I got really angry, and I mean really angry, uh, reading this story. So I just want to have full transparency. This story makes me so... Mad. This is from Fox News. Minnesota public schools. And by the way, I am working on an opinion article. Working on an opinion article that is uh, going to give some commentary on this. Um, and it's titled, "The you, America is in shambles and the church is to blame. And I 100% stand by that. The mainstream modern evangelical church, for the most part, now there's good churches out there that are fighting against this garbage. But most of them are complicit, and this is why. So uh, let's read read a little bit of the article, and then we'll get into it. So Minnesota Public Schools asks students to role-play sex scenarios as gay or trans, and activists take issue. So activists spoke out against a sex ed program used in Minnesota school district that includes asking straight students to role play gay and transgender relationships. Quote, 
Parents are intentionally being deceived and misled about what their children are being taught. One concerned speaker said at the Richfield School Board meeting Monday, programs like 3Rs are not effective, said Julie Quist, a Child Protection League board member, while another speaker at the meeting said, quote, this type of teaching has no place in our schools. The speakers were referring to the program called the three R's, which stands for Rights, Respect, Responsibility, and was put together by Advocates for Youth, a group partnered with Planned Parenthood. Shocker there. And that is uh, that was reported by Alpha News, the article says. Um, quote, while many, sexual, sex, while many sexuality education materials have addressed the needs of adolescents, Advocates for Youth realizes that such education must begin much earlier. The website for Advocates for Youth explains under its, quote, rationale for curriculum section. Quote, the K through 12 curriculum, K through 12, they are starting this stuff in kindergarten is a collection of lessons of a wide range of topics, including self-understanding, family growth and development, friendship, sexuality, life skills, and health promotion. The lessons include asking students to role-play various... That was the end of the quote, by the way, so this is a new paragraph. The lessons include asking students to role-play various relationship scenarios, including straight students pretending they are in a gay or lesbian relationship and to work through whether the hypothetical couple should have sex. This is disgusting. And it doesn't matter... I mean, it, it does because, let, you know, the Bible is very clear that a relationship is between one man and one woman. That's what marriage is defined as. We've been over this before. Now, here's the thing. But when you're talking about sex in general, it does not matter what kind of relationship it is. You've heard Dan say this. Sex is not something that should be taught to kindergartners. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is what, in one of the lessons, a student is asked to pretend to be a male named Morgan, who is, quote, very attractive in his school's LGBTQ club, while another student is asked to be Terrence, a student who wants to, you know, with Morgan, and is not publicly out as gay. Morgan then outlines a plan for the two students to secretly meet according to the curriculum, and they, quote, make a decision about whether to have sex. Other lessons include having students pretend they are transgender and make a decision about having sex with a woman curriculum on, oh, God. God help us. If you have kids in the room, go ahead and get them out. Um... A curriculum on A-N-A-L sex. I'm not going to say that. Um, but for the sake of, you know, well, first of all, why, why are they teaching? The, there's K through 12. And see, this is what I mean. When I say that this is the church's fault, this is the church's fault because if the if the church taught the Bible like they were supposed to, then they would know that teaching the child is not the responsibility of the U.S. government, but is your responsibility as the parent. I get it. People can't afford private school, which I'm not a big fan of private school anyway, as somebody who graduated from a private school and was homeschooled for years before that. I get it. Not everybody can do homeschool, homeschooling or private schooling, but if there is a way to work that out in any way possible, and I would pray, and I would pray hard that God gives you the ability to be able to homeschool, and this is why. Because it is your responsibility as a parent, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, to teach your child. And Let's see. So here's what we're going to do. Let's head over to, we're going to go to Bible Hub, just so we can pull this up, because we're going to read this. This needs to be broken down, because this is why things like this are happening in America, because the church has had a dereliction of duty. Deuteronomy chapter 6 
And we're going to start in verse 4. This is the Shema for anybody who may not be familiar. This is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command. Now, see, that's where most people start because you always hear the church say, Oh, well, there's two commandments that Jesus has, and those are the ones that Christians need to live to. And that's love God and love your neighbor. But they forget that both of those come from passages in the Old Testament, specifically in the Torah. And this is what it says. So it goes on because this is the start of that. And because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and might, this is what you're supposed to do. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and I will write my law on their heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt teach them diligently. Thou, you as the parent, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. By the way, guess what part of the Bible lines out what a proper biblical relationship is? If you guess the Torah, ding, 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 you are a winner. It's right there in the first few chapters of Genesis. And a man, uh, let, you know what? Let's read it. Let's read it. Genesis this is what they call the leave and cleave passage, right? So, it is right there. So, this is Genesis chapter 2 and um, and starting in 21. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. Now, Adam, a lot of people uh, call him the first man. Um, but Adam was a very special man. Adam was set aside for God. Now, for those of you who don't know, I hold to the belief that there was a pre-Adamite civilization. Um, I believe that when it says that God created man, uh, male and female, he created them, and he um, told them be fruitful and multiply at, over the earth in Genesis chapter 1, that that is a different creation account than Genesis chapter 2. I believe that Adam was set apart for the purpose of being a minister for God. All right. So anyway, this is what it says. But it doesn't matter whether it's Adam where or whether it's the six-day man. The point is he made them male and female. But check this out. So this is Adam. This is the first named man mentioned in the Bible. So a deep sleep fell upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, because woman was taken out of man, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked and the man and his wife and were not ashamed these are the things that you as a parent and i as a parent are to teach our children but because the church has had a dereliction of duty and they don't read anything before Matthew, unless they're just running out of ideas and they want to go to the Old Testament, they teach these watered down in Sunday school so the kids have a general idea, but they're so watered down that they don't have any principles that the kids learn. Oh, well, the kids learn you have to obey because Eve ate an apple and she didn't obey, and now she knew she was naked, and because of that, we all do bad things. Well, that's great, but why are we not teaching our children basic principles out of that? Like, oh, hey, in the beginning, in the garden, God created Adam, and he took the rib out of Adam and then made the woman. And because of that, we have been given an institution of marriage, which is sacred. It has to be done. True marriage can only be done between a man and woman and a covenant between the two of them that God is the head of. If it is not done in that, you may get married, but I'm telling you that it's a proper, pro proper biblical marriage is one man, one woman with God as the head of the relationship, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
So, these are the principles that you and I are to teach to our children, so that way when things like this come up, they have a proper biblical understanding. Proverbs says, train your child up in the way that he should go, and when he is older, he shall not depart from it. By the way, the word train is to dedicate. You dedicate your child to learning the law of God. And the church doesn't understand this because they don't know how to read their Bibles. Now, you have great churches out there, and I don't agree with everything they say, but hey, at least they're teaching God's moral law. Yeah, do they do other things that I disagree with? Absolutely. But you got to start somewhere. And I'm not going to hold the fact that they don't have it all right against them, because at least they're teaching their children to love God and keep his commandments. Do they do it all? No, but neither did any of us. At one time. So I'm going to have a little grace and I'm going to cheer my brother on for the things that he gets right. And I'm going to rebuke them, rebuke him for the things he gets wrong. So there's that. Um, that just, this article just makes me sick. Oh, gosh. You can read the whole article. I'm not going to because it is just absolutely the stuff they are teaching these kids is degenerate. And all it is is grooming. They're grooming the children. You know, there's statistics, um, and I don't know the statistics off my hand, off the top of my hand, but, you know, they say that there's only a very small percentage of the population identifies with some sort of homosexuality or transgender, you know, a part of that that group. Um, but the, the representation on TV is like almost three or four times that. Um, so there's, you know, there's... There's an agenda going on here, absolutely. So more bad news. Disneyland's uh, recovering from a massive attendance decline in 2020, which is unfortunate. Um, Don't take your children to Disney. I mean, guys, most of you guys know this, so I'm preaching to the choir there. But don't take your kids to Disney. Just don't do it. Um, Multiple House Republicans have backed a bill to prohibit... uh, the uh, federal jab mandates. Um, a haunted house boy was uh, stabbed in Cleveland, but was bandaged up and finished it. And I wanted to read that story because, guys, it's that time of year. It is now October, and um, we're going to try. I'm going to try to talk to Dan, see if we can work something out to where we can do a special on Halloween together. Because for those of you who don't know, and my wife put up something wonderful on Facebook, and when we come back from the break here in a minute, because we're at about, you know, we're we're coming up on about 35 minutes in, we're going to take a break. So we're going to read through some of these stories, and we're going to come back with our apostate report for the week. So, um, but... She put up an excellent thing about how you can't serve two masters, and if you celebrate Halloween then you are, by default, you are not serving God, and that the Holy Spirit has no place in you because you haven't made room for him. Great point. Uh, we'll, we'll try to bring it back up um, before then. So uh, there is, let's see. So apparently Secretary Miguel Cardona supports, um, you know, jab mandates for children um, in school. An article from Reformation Charlotte says that Tucker Carlson exposes Satanism PowerPoint presentation for the military jab program. From Russia Today, Texas migrant camp has been cleared. Uh, Also from Russia Today, uh, Prince Andrew served a lawsuit regarding the Epstein situation. Uh, La Palma Town are uh, evacuated due to the volcano. And the FDA... Blow dart. Um, and we, yeah, I want to show you this because this is we're going to actually get into this article before we go to our break. So, this is uh, from Project Veritas, and you can find this article in the show notes. This is from Russia Today, but Project Veritas did another, uh, you know, another hot take where they had a hidden camera on an FDA employee and he was caught saying that African Americans should be vaccinated against their will. Now, keep in mind, this was brought out about the same time that Black Lives Matter is out protesting the mandates in 
Um, I believe it was New York um, because they're saying that they're racist. And look, guys, this is the plan. This is Jim Crow 2.0. That's all it is because that's how these things. So let's play this so you guys can hear a part of it. This is absolutely outrageous. How Deception Propaganda, a new book by James O'Keefe. Pre-order now at AmericanMuckraker.com. Get blow darts of J&J and go to the unvaccinated and blow it into them. Blow dart it into them. I remember reading about how with COVID trials, they were having an issue recruiting African-American people. Can't blame them. I can't, but at the same time, like, blow dart. It's where we're going. There needs to be a registry of the people who aren't vaccinated. Although that's sounding very Germany. The Germany that you're thinking of. Is it? Nazi Germany. I mean, think about it like the Jewish stuff. You were like the FDA or something? Yeah. So Again. In, so in order. Low dark. <laughs> it is the perfect answer. <laughs> and since J&J is an mRNA, you have no issue of it counteracting with anything else. So again, you just shoot everyone. So drones. Drone darts. Easy. How do we reach the minority populations? Blow darts is always the answer. Yes. I will cheers to them. Yes, cheers. And the people who are like, oh, the vaccine's terrible. It's the Antichrist. They're like, yes, our savior. <laughs> so if they start handing out vaccines, I'm going to go door to door and stab everyone. Oh, it's just your booster shot. Stick your arm out. Exactly. What's that? Oh, it's just a vitamin C shot. Again, if you're an undercover journalist, you can't quote me. Again, if you're an undercover journalist, you can't quote me. government doesn't want to show that the darn vaccine is full of shit. You need to register the people who aren't vaccinated. That's sounding very germane. I'm gonna go door to door and stab everyone. Oh, it's just your booster shot. All right, I think we get the point with that. But, um, yeah, I didn't want to play that, guys. You can't make this stuff up. Um, you can read the rest of the article that goes with it. It's just crazy. Yeah, uh, this is a tweet that was done. Um, it's crazy to me how the new Project Veritas video can be dismissed as, quote, he's just a dude that isn't that high up in the USDA. When he literally, when he's literally saying they should blow dart people with the jab. IDAF, where is in rank? It's effed up, and it should be national news. God, you, you can't make this stuff up. Literally, all they are doing is... They're just... They're saying the quiet part out loud. That's all it is. So we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back here in just a few minutes, and we are going to do the second segment of the show which is the apostate report. And then at the end, in a bonus segment that you can find at our website, won't be on the YouTube show, but there will be a bonus segment with this week's news, I promise. So we'll be right back, guys, here on Course Correction Radio. Welcome back from the break, my friends. So um, we're going to get right, we're going to jump right into it. I don't think this segment is going to take very long, but, um, well, you never know. You can't be, yeah, you can't be too careful. So this is from ReformationCharlotte.org, and it says, Amid growing frustration... Among lay people, SBC leadership, that's the Southern Baptist Convention, SBC leadership finally calls on Ed Litton, the sitting president, to resign. So while it's been like pulling teeth trying to get Southern Baptist leaders to break the 11th commandment, 
you know, the one that says thou shalt not speak out against other SBC leaders. Some leaders are sensing the growth, the growing frustration among lay people who are quickly tiring of the repeated failure of the leadership to take action when action is necessary. Speaking, of course, in the context of the Southern Baptist president, Ed Litton's plagiarism and lying scandal. Now, it's been over three months since Litton was elected and his serial plagiarism was exposed. If you're unaware of the scandal, you can brush up on it at this link, and the article provides a hyperlink there. While some conservative small church pastors, bloggers, and simply frustrated lay people have been repeatedly calling on Ed Litton to repent of his plagiarism and resign, his position as president. The upper leadership of the denomination has been nauseatingly slow to act. It's not as though they were unaware or unconvinced of the scandal. It's simply that nobody has been able to hold them accountable for their inaction. Just two weeks ago, Al Moeller of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary finally broke his silence when pressured by a student to answer pointed questions about Ed Litton's plagiarism and how plagiarism would be dealt with at his seminary. While he did finally denounce the plagiarism and express that he believed Litton to be a poor example for students, he practically absolved himself of any responsibility to act. He stated that it was a matter for the convention to handle not him. Simply not true, the article says. All Christians, especially pastors, elders, and leaders, are responsible for speaking up and confronting when others are in sin. Moeller should have been publicly and boldly calling not only for Lytton's voluntary resignation from his office as president, but also for his repentance before God. Further, he should have been publicly calling for his church to discipline him. Instead, he contended that it was not for him to do. Finally, however, amid growing pressure from Southern Baptists, more leaders are speaking out. The leadership of Kenwood Baptist Church, which includes Dr. Jim Hamilton and Dr. Denny Burke, both on staff at Muller Seminary, released a statement calling on Lytton to resign. Quote, We believe that Dr. Lytton would do well to resign voluntarily. His credibility as a leader and preacher has been too compromised for him to continue. He may choose to muddle through the next convention or two, but we believe that would be a mistake. He should resign, the letter reads. Quote, in despite of the fact that Dr. Litton has had, permi- had permission to use Greer's sermons, what he did still constitutes plagiarism. The letter continued, over the summer, numerous news outlets reported that the newly elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. Ed Litton, had plagiarized a number of sermons from J.D. Greer. That, uh... There's uh, some hyperlinks cited here, uh, some like citations with hyperlinks, I should say, um, which is the New York Times, Newsweek, and Religious News Services. Other evidence subsequently came to light suggesting that he had plagiarized at least one other sermon from Tim Keller as well. Now, I've actually seen the video on that one, and that one is probably the worst of all the offenders. So bad that uh, somebody actually took that. And what I'll try to do is, um, in between now and uploading this, I will try to take that, uh, find that link, and place it in the show notes. That way you can watch that for yourself, because it is bad. Oh, my goodness. It is so bad. So the elders, also called... Into question Lytton's qualifications as a pastor, noting that while God is, will freely forgive him of his sins, this is a separate issue from his ability and qualifications to teach and lead. 
Third, forgiveness of sins is not the same thing as qualification for leadership. While the Lord freely offers forgiveness to any penitent sinner, we nevertheless believe that Dr. Litton has engaged in behavior that is disqualifying for an elder. The plagiarism scandal has re- has raised questions about whether his appo- his, he is apt to teach above reproach and of good reputation with those outside the church. First Timothy three one through seven. It raises questions at, uh, whether he is quote diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. Second Timothy two fifteen, preaching is the central task of the pastor, a consistent pattern of copying sermons and falsely passing them off as one's own suggests not only a failure of truthfulness, but also a failure of the central task of a pastor. It suggests a neglect, it says in quotes, of the pastoral calling. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to recommend for y'all that have not seen it, And I will put a link to the video in the show notes. And I'm going to make a mental note of that now because I always say that and I always forget. So forgive me. I am going to put in the show notes a link to an FOJC radio uh, remnant gathering that was done a while back on um, false coverings. And... One of the things that Brother David goes into great detail is is the way that the current office of the pastorate is set up to where the pastor is an authority over you and you put yourself under his covering. Brother David breaks it down, goes through the part we were talking about earlier where the uh, God is the head and then the man and then the woman. Um, he goes through and shows that uh, that the pastor doesn't fit anywhere into that equation. So there is that for you. Um, We're going to exit out of this article because it is driving me nuts. It'll let me. I don't know what is going on here. I mean, my goodness, if this thing will let me, hey, did it? Ay, ay, ay. Hmm. Well, anyway, you guys get the point with that. So, um,. Sorry, give me just a second. By the way, this is why it's not a good idea to use a touchscreen tablet when you have a lot of scrolling to do because, well, you're going to mess yourself up. All right, there we go. I've got everything fixed now. Yay. We did it. So there was one thing I wanted to do. So let's look into this denouncing the plagiarism thing. This is also an article from Reformation Charlotte. And Al Mohler says Ed Litton is not a good example for uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary students. Now, Al Mohler recently appeared in a QA and a session with his students at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary where he, directly was, he was directly asked by one of his students about Ed Litton's plagiarism. The student asked him pointedly how SBTS students should respond academically as well as how he believes the Southern Baptist Convention should deal with the situation. And this was the answer. Quote, There is no doubt that the conversation we're having right now is occasioned by the fact that the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. Ed Litton, has been involved to some some degree in the preaching of someone else's sermons, Mueller responded. And beyond that, we can see the whole issue of kind of 
the manufacture of sermons, which is now widespread. I would say I would simply have to say that this is precisely not what we are trying to teach or hold up as an example here. Muller went on to say that since Ed Litton was elected the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, no doubt because of his many gifts, that it would be right for the Southern Baptist Convention to deal with the issue to uh, uh, with the issue of how our to deal with the issue of how to deal with Lytton's plagiarism scandal. Moeller insisted that he had to leave that issue with them. I, of all people, should not imply that I know the answer to that question. Um, so basically, student asked him, and it was a big non-answer. Which, uh, in my experience, as somebody who has been in the Southern Baptist, uh, you know, denomination... You know, I was in it for quite a bit on and off in my life. Uh, you see mealy mouth answers like that all the time. So, anyway. Uh, uh, so, I, I guess a great example would be in the book of Galatians, where Paul was talking to the Galatians about how he saw Peter... Um, basically, uh, he was doing one thing, you know, sitting with Gentiles, eating at the table, and then the Judaizers walked in, and all of a sudden, Peter stopped, which was wrong. What did Paul do? Paul publicly, publicly called Peter out. He didn't say, I think that the churches, uh, the, the elders of this church in this area should deal with it. No, he publicly called him out. So, that's just my opinion. I mean, I think that is an excellent... I think there's something... I think there's something to that. So, um, I also... If it's alright with y'all, I would love to play this video real quick of a fellow YouTuber, podcaster, um, by the name of A.D. Robles. I'm not going to play the whole thing. You guys, if you want to see it, this is part of um, what he had to say. Uh, and as is... Ed Litton, Fake Repents, Spiritual Manipulation. So let's play it. We're going to listen to some of it. See? Hello there. This is A.D. Robles, and you're listening to A.D. on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. All right. You may be confused to know that uh, that I'm an anonymous uh, YouTuber. Yeah, that's right. I'm an anonymous social media uh, user. Uh, I, I know that I, I started my... Uh, <laughs> I know that I started this conversation with my name, and uh, you can see a video image of me. And yeah, actually, you could have met me uh, the other day. I was at the Fight, Laugh, Feast conference, uh, live and in person, using my real name and all of that. But uh, but yeah, so but I am I am an anonymous social media person. Just in case you wanted to know. By the way, speaking of the Fight, Laugh, Feast conference, a couple things. This what's on my shirt, and then underneath it says Leviticus. Uh, they come out with plagiarized sermons, so it's a big scam that they're running here. And uh, he's currently on a, a poor me routine here. Uh, this is a conversation with, uh, I guess this is Adam Greenway. I, I don't know. Who knows who this person is? But this is at a seminary, so Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And this is preposterous. Like, uh, you, you're, you're bringing a plagiarizer to say, oh, poor me, to a seminary where I would assume you don't expect your your students to plagiarize. But anyway, let's hear him out because I wasn't going to do a video on this, but I watched John Harris uh, comment on it. And I love John uh, very, very much. He's a real nice guy, though. And so when I heard what was being said by Ed Litton and I heard John Harris's. Yes, yeah, so just to give you guys a little uh, background information on how A.D. Robles handles things, he is, uh, he does not mince words and um, he's actually. Uh, People tell him that he is uh, mean a lot, that he handles things meanly. He doesn't say things very nicely, but, uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, well, number one, plagiarism is a crime. Number two, it is unethical. And number three, it's a sin because you're lying. Um, so, you know, maybe this isn't the time for sugarcoating things. But anyway, I digress. Harris's nice reaction to it. You know, I said, you know, we need a little bit of spice in here. And so we're going to get some spice and I didn't even flip a coin this time. We're just going to go for it. So let's listen 
and see what he has to say. Conversation, controversy, uh, claims have been thrown around, particularly as it relates to uh, your preaching ministry in the context of your service at uh, Redemption Church in Mobile, where you've been the pastor now for uh, many, many years. It's not just claims, by the way. So this is funny. He, he, he tries to make it seem, well, there's just a lot of people that are making these claims. Well, it's, it's more than claims, uh, because these videos have come out which line up the word-for-word stealing of sermon illustrations, things that's allegedly happened to Ed Litton, but really just happened to J.D. Greer. Like, it's it's brutal. The, the Tim Keller one is my favorite, which is the worst one, because his wife gets in on it, and his wife is plagiarizing just like Ed is plagiarizing, which means that it's totally plagiarism, because um, the chances of both the wife and Ed magically coming out with the exact same wording as Tim Keller uh, are just too great. I mean, the, obviously, Ed didn't do that either. I'm just saying... If you were going to believe that Ed magically just came out with the same words and the same illustrations and the same everything, you're, I mean, if you believe that, you're stupid. But if you believe that both of them did it <laughs> magically, independently, then you're, I mean, it's hopeless for you at that point. Oh, gosh, that's hilarious. Um, talk to us about that because there have been all kinds of uh, statements and, and claims. Uh, you can imagine that when I posted on social media that we were hosting you for this conversation, uh, there was a, a lot of, um, of snark uh, that came back particularly from the uh, anonymous uh, social media accounts that proliferate uh, these days. <laughs> but I, I'd love for you to just talk about, particularly in light of... There's, there's so uh, many... Is, and, and the thing is, like, obviously I'm not anonymous, but the thing is, there's so many people commenting about this that are not anonymous either. This is just all a big scam. And Ed Litton is over here with his glasses in his hand. I'm look very serious. I'm very thoughtful here. And uh, let's just see what Ed has to say about this, because Ed, uh, Ed's been saying a variety of things. If you remember, the initial thing was, well, you know, my, my team did it. Yeah, it was my team who did it. I didn't do it. And, and then it was like, well, you know, like I, I asked J.D. Greer's permission. So like it, first it was the team. Then it was it was me. But I asked permission. Let's see what he's up to now. Come to be known in the common parlance as the sermon plagiarism controversy. Uh, and I'd like to even hear you accept uh, the term plagiarism to describe uh, your actions in terms of your preaching ministry, yes or no, why? Just help us understand, uh, for the benefit of our seminary community, the issue here. Well, first let me start by saying that I take preaching very seriously. Uh, seven and a half years as a church planter in Arizona and then 27 years at Redemption Church. He takes preaching very seriously. So serious that he steals his sermons from other people. Yeah, that's a guy who takes it serious. What a joke. I'm going to be nice because um, one of the terms of service, and I want to respect it, but one of the terms of service for Spreaker is not to mock people. I'm not sure what the context of that is, but I'm just going to play it safe right now. You know, if we get into bonus segments or anything like that, I might not hold back because, you know, the bonus segments are only going to be on our website. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, there's that. So, um, but that doesn't even make sense. I take it very seriously. Like, guys, this isn't claim. You can find this stuff online where he is literally, he has, like, just pilfered other people's sermons. Anyway, and I want to play the video of AD breaking this down because he could do it way better than I can. Like, this is his wheelhouse. This is... I, I'm a rookie with this stuff, but he, he actually does a really good job of breaking it down. It is critical that the man of God to preach the word of God and the truth of God to God's people, and that there is a trust relationship built when that is done. You can see kind of like the way he answers here. Uh, these are all prepared questions and prepared answers. So first of all, I'm, uh, I'm very glad you asked. I was talking to some guys at the, the conference about how the uh, the authenticity of this con- this channel and like the Fight, Laugh, Feast guys and stuff like that, like – it's just so apparent that that we don't we don't talk about you know what well, I'm going to ask you these three questions beforehand so you can prepare. It's like it's not like that, but you can always tell with like Big Eva conferences or speeches where it's like so obviously pre planned, but they try to pretend like it's not. It'll be something like, well, you know, what do you think about this, uh, Ed? And he's like, well, I'm so glad you asked that question. I've got a three point answer. It's like obviously we all talked about it. it's just it's just so. Uh, uh, artificial is what it is. It's, uh, this is an artificial answer, Ed. But this is actually makes it even worse because this is pre-planned, pre-thought out, and we're going to see <laughs> what he comes up with. This is 
This is brutal, guys. Like, if, if it was off the cuff and it was like he was surprised by this question, you could at least excuse it because he's trying to make something up on the fly. But this is like a well thought up lie. So let's just let's just listen to this. So there is a high value and primacy in preaching. The situation that we find ourselves in today is that uh, a series of messages we did last year on the book of Romans, uh, which I want to just be honest with you, uh, was intimidating for me. I've preached Romans before. But a lot of things have changed in my life in the last 10 years that I may get to in a moment. But, but when I approached that, I noticed uh, that I had my commentaries. I bought new commentaries. I just want to say that the book of Romans is one of those books. It is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a deep book. So, I, I, I you know, <laughs> that's just so funny, though. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. <laughs> Great time to start. You haven't been thus far, but hey, Go for it. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, you know, and speaking of Romans, we're going to be doing something uh, in our last segment here in the next few minutes. We're going to look. We're going to do another response to um, Todd Friel, and we're going to look at the... Um, you know, we're going to look at that doctrine of lesser magistrates. I've got a great article that was written on that that I highly recommend that you look into if you want to know these things because the way that dispensationalists teach how Romans 13 goes, they are going to be the destruction of God's people. Mark my words. Anyway, let's get back into this. New commentaries preparing for that series. We actually plan our preaching about two years in advance. And in that particular case, I started listening to J.D. Greer, who had done a series just previous to this. Yeah, that's what I, I do. Was- <laughs> so first of all, so so one of the things that Ed tries to hear, guys, and, and this is something, uh, I don't know if you ever listen to like uh, anti-MLM content or stuff like that. Um, but regularly, a lot of, and, and you know, whatever, if you want to do MLM, I don't have a problem with it. But like... Um, the point is, like, a lot of the presentations you hear will start to introduce, like, spirituality into it. Well, God wants you for this for you. He wants you to have time freedom and stuff like that. And it's almost like this this spiritual manipulation. Um, Ed Litton actually does a lot of spiritual manipulation here. The, the very he, he starts to set it up here uh, in the beginning where he wants you to believe that he's like this uber spiritual sort of guy. And here's how he sets it up. Well, I was I, 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 I was quite intimidated by preaching Romans and 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 I got all my 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 my, my commentaries and, and and then I started listening to J.D. Greer and it's like, yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that, that's what you do. Right. Like if you're intimidated by Romans, instead of just, you know, manning up and, you know, finding your courage to preach it, uh, which I can certainly understand. No, no, no. What you do is you listen to J.D. Greer. That, that he, He's the one that you want to listen to. You get the commentaries. Yeah, you know, you got Matthew Henry. You got uh, John Calvin. Uh, you got Luther. And then you got J.D. Greer. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, what giants, the shoulders of giants we're standing on here. But you can see he's setting up this manipulation where he's like, well, feel sorry for me because I was intimidated. It's like, man up, bro. I was really moved by the way he handled some very challenging passages in Romans. So I called J.D. and I asked him, I said, first of all, would you mind sharing with me how you broke down the book of Romans to do it in one year? Which He sent me a spreadsheet with all that information. That was very helpful. So as a part of the preaching planning. But then I said, there are, there's material here. Do you mind if I use this material? He was very gracious. And I think even quoted Adrian Rogers, if my bullet fits your gun, shoot it. And I said, that's fine, and I appreciate it. So there are in a couple of particular cases, times where I made statements that others have been able to line up with statements that from the same text, the same passage that uh, J.D. used. Uh, So to answer your question, I don't consider that plagiarism. (laughs) Let me tell you where my sin Uh, So, and he's going to... Do he's gonna uh, AD's gonna talk about this as well, but um, no, it's not just lines and text that line up. It's literally the same points from the outline, with like maybe a slight variation of word, but it's the same points. And I've showed you guys some of them. Um, you can go back to our docent, uh, to the docent research one we did, and then the weekend news bulletin right before that. We went over this stuff. It's there. So this is this is another lie. 
my sin was. My sin was. <laughs> let's, stop, let's, let's stop here. Let's stop here. I don't consider that plagiarism. And he makes it seem like it's like, well, these people were able to edit it in such a way where it kind of seems similar and you line it up. And, and like, that's not what happened, bro. <laughs> like, it is word for word down to the illustrations. Stop lying, man. <laughs> This is just preposterous. It's like it's not like it's similar. It's not like it's similar wording. It's not like you use the same word because yeah, well, like you use the word Trinity, I use the word Trinity. It's like it's not like that. That's kind of the impression he's trying to give here. What it is is it's the outline is exactly the same. The wording is exactly the same with minor variations, and the illustrations that you say allegedly happened to you or whatever didn't happen to you. They happened to J.D. Greer, maybe. We don't even know if it happened to J.D. Greer because J.D. Greer is, a, is what you le- at least used to be a customer of Docent Research Group. So, so that's not plagiarism, according to him. So, so, so copying the, the, the sermon uh, illustrations, copying the outlines, and stuff, that's not plagiarism, according to Ed Litton. But he's about to tell us what his big sin is. So this is the part where... This, we go from not only is he lying, but he's about to admit what his big sin is. And I've got that in the uh, little title that I put above the embed of AD's video on our website. But since we're doing this segment audio only, I did not want to give it away because it is that ridiculous. And here it goes. Make sure you're paying attention for this now, and uh, make sure that if you have a loose pelvic floor, that you have a diaper or a towel, because you will pee your pants when you hear this. I'm ready. I did not credit him to my church. And, and it, I've been asked why. And I'm a little mystified by that, too, because uh, I'm very transparent with my people. And the goal of, of using material, whether it's written by R. Kent Hughes or international critical commentary or any other commentary you use, is to, to expound on the text and to make sure people understand the verse-by-verse meaning of that text. So it's not so that, plagiarism, but he, he admits he didn't cite it, and, that, and he says that's a sin. So what's the sin? If it's not stealing, then what is it? This is what I don't understand. Like, he's, he's, he's apologizing for something— but we're not even sure what that thing is, and he's not being forthcoming with it. Well, you know, I didn't cite him. That's what plagiarism is, by the way, when you when you say what somebody else said but don't cite him. And he's like, well, I'm very transparent with my people. I, I'm mystified as to why I didn't. I know why you didn't cite it, because it would have been apparent you didn't do the work, Ed. That's why you didn't cite it, because it's not like a line here or there. It's like, like imagine if I quoted someone, like he just did it. He quoted Adrian Rogers, and he said, if my bullet fits your gun, go ahead and shoot it. And it's like, and he, and he just said that, and he didn't quote Adrian Rogers. Like, some people might be upset about that, but I would understand that, because sometimes you're talking fast, you quote, quote someone, you don't remember the name of the person, whatever it is, and it just might happen. Or, this is the kind of, we're going to talk about this in a second, you might remember a phrase, but you don't remember that it's a quote, and you just, but it's not just a quotation, it's not just a turn of phrase, it's the entire sermon, large sections of thoughts and, 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 and processes and logical progressions. Lar- it's not just, he's trying to make it seem like, well, it's just a one-liner, and, I, and then my big sin is I didn't, I didn't cite it. No, 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 it's the whole thing, though, and it's the whole series as well. I mean, John Harris was saying, I think, not credit him, and I have repented of that to my church. I have repented that to our leadership. And quite frankly, we're in a process of changing. Let's skip ahead a what little bit. did you repent of, though? If it's not stealing, which is what plagiarism is, then what is it? We don't know. We don't know. And and I, I, I like that where he tries to make it. He tries to he tries to say, well, I wouldn't have quoted J.D. Greer. And, and then, well, that, that mystifies us as well. But but you certainly would have quoted J.D. Greer because you understand that J.D. Greer was the Recent president of the SBC, he's a very popular guy. Why wouldn't you steal from J.D. Greer if you wanted to become famous? Stupid. I can't even, I can't even fathom how stupid this is. Let's, let's listen in. Become famous, because quite frankly, if that was my goal, I would not have picked J.D. Greer as someone to quote. The problem was I did not credit him, and I have repented of that to my church. By the way, he, 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 he didn't, it's not just that he quoted him. Let's, let's just get that out of the way again. Again, he's making it seem, well, just one little quote. And No, it's the entire 
sermon ed that's the problem so it it is again it's confusing to me why you would uh want to steal jd greer's sermon but that's not my that's not for me to explain that's for you to explain so i don't know why you did it but you did it now let's listen to this this is this is the ch- big changes are coming big changes to to ed litton's uh sermon prep i have repented that to our leadership and quite frankly we're in a process of changing some I'm fasting from listening to preaching right now. He's fasting from from (laughs) listening. What the heck does that even mean? What the heck does that? I'm fasting from listening to preaching right now. (laughs) Oh, goodness gracious. That is funny. Sermons. And the reason he's fasting from listening to sermons is because he's got this capacity. It's like a superpower. He's got this super. Yeah, this is the part I want to get into. Doesn't mean that it's actually, you know, uh, good. You, you, what you're good, what you're saying is, well, you know, it, 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 the the problem that I have. Much of a nice way to say what I was going to say, but but this is this is so manipulative, right? Because you know, if you at this point, if you're going to still hold on to the reality that he's plagiarizing, what he wants you to think is that you are you are beating someone while they're repenting. He's not repenting of anything. Fasting from listening to from listening to sermons sorry i lost like, the place so i'm trying to find it what he again. really means by that is i don't i'm gonna stop stealing sermons for the time being and he's calling it a fast to make it spiritual dude That's a good point this is so this is so manipulative sorry about that i had to pause it there I, you know <laughs> didn't have didn't have much of a nice way to say what i was gonna say but but this is this is so manipulative right because you know, if you at this point, if you're going to still hold on to the reality that he's plagiarizing, what he wants you to think is that you are you are beating someone while they're repenting. He's not repenting of anything. Fasting from listening to sermons? Are you kidding me? Just because you make it sound spiritual doesn't mean that it's actually you know uh, good. You, you, what you're go- what you're saying is well. You know, it, 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 the, the problem that I had was that I was listening to too many sermons, and I just, well, we're going to hear about that in a minute. Let's listen to the rest of this. Turns out I have a capacity to remember statements that are made in an audible sermon that I hear. It's a little too good, and sometimes it gets mixed up. But, but the truth is, uh, this has been— So there it is. That's Ed Litton's big sin is he is just so smart that uh, he didn't plagiarize, but he's just so smart that he forgot— where he heard it. You cannot make this stuff up. How stupid does he think people are? And apparently some people are pretty stupid because they bought this hook, line, and sinker. This is freaking ridiculous. This has been... A- Let AD give his, his thing on it, because I'm telling you, he does so much better breaking this down than I could ever possibly do, and I thought about it, honestly. I was like, you know, I, I really thought about whether or not I was going to break this down, and I thought about it, but I was like, you know, so many people have already done it, um, but I felt like, you know, I wanted to play at least parts of it for you guys, because he really does, in my opinion, do a great job of breaking this down in ways that I just wouldn't have thought of. Because this is his wheelhouse. This is what he does. A very painful process. Stop it right there. So, so he's fasting from listening to sermons. And the reason he's fasting from listening to sermons is because he's got this capacity. It's like a superpower. He's got this superpower, and the superpower is, well, you know, I remember these these things from the sermons. Like, I remember the entire outline of an hour-long sermon, including all the illustrations, including all of the the, uh, the, 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 the points and the bullets and stuff like that. I, but I get confused. I'm just confused. I'm just, now, now, see, now, if you're going to stay with this, now you're, you're beating up on a man who was uh, just, you know, really wanted to honor God. He was terrified, so he was fearing God. And he's already repented of what? Well, we have no idea, but he's, but he's fasting. That's good. We know that fasting's good, so he's doing a good thing now. And so he's fasting, and you're beating up on an old man who's just confused. He just got confused is what happened. It's not that he stole the sermons. It's not that he stole Tim Keller's and J.D. Greer's sermons. It's not that his wife stole t- uh, Tim Keller's sermon. No, 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 no. He's just a confused old man, and so now you're beating up on an uber-spiritual and very smart confused old man who's already repented so get over it 
This is such a manipulation, guys, and I, I really hope that you see this for what it is and you see through this nonsense. He wants this to stop, but he's not going to do the things he needs to do, which is actually repent of the sin of stealing by plagiarizing. That's So that's what we're going to play of that. If you guys do want to watch that, and look, I just want to, I want to make this uh, clear right now. Um, I've had some dialogue with AD in the past, and we were uh, looking at, I asked him if he wanted to come on as a guest, because he's got a great book on, you know, uh, social justice uh, inside the church, things like that. I've actually got it in, um, in my shelf in my room. Really easy to write, but I was going to see if he wanted to come on, but we do have some theological differences, and um, he said he was going to look at the stuff to make sure that, you know, it wouldn't line up, because, uh, so he is, uh, he's a, a Calvinist Presbyterian, um, now, as you guys know, I'm not a Calvinist, um, but, so, I definitely don't, uh, it's not an endorsement of everything that he believes, However, when it comes to stuff like this, he does such a phenomenal job. I wanted to play part of it for you. If you are interested in looking at the rest of the video, a link will be in the show notes. But I did want to give that disclaimer that me sharing that is not an endorsement of necessarily everything that he believes. Because we probably do have some significant um, differences in certain areas. But uh, A.D. is a theonomist, which means that he believes that the best law there is to govern society should be God's law. Um, and he does a great job. I've never seen, I mean, you know, I've had some quibbles there, here and there, but for the most part, the way that he breaks down God's law and applies it, I, I think is great. Um, but I, once again, just want to give that disclaimer. This is not necessarily an endorsement of everything he believes. So I just want you guys to know that, um, And as always, whether it's me, whether it's anybody that you may listen to, discernment, discernment, uh, scrutiny, you know, and nobody is beyond reproach. That's the point. So let's see, we're at about another 40 minutes, so we're going to take another break and we'll be right back for the third segment of the show. I guess you could technically say that it is the third hour of the show or something like that. You know, we're not quite, you know, it'll be a little under... Show will be a little under, you know, round two and a half, maybe three hours. Yeah, you know, about like normal. So uh, we're going to come back for the final two segments, which is tax the rich. What does the Bible say? And we're going to look into the doctrine of lesser magistrates and do the rebuttal to that. We'll go from there. So, guys, don't go anywhere. We will be right back on Course Correction Radio. Welcome back to Course Correction Radio, my friends. Um, we are, I believe this is what, segment three for tonight. So yeah, we're doing pretty strong. Uh, thank you guys for waiting. Um, and if you are just tuning in, thank you for joining us. So we're going to get right into the third segment for tonight. And uh, we're starting this off with an article that we wrote um, on September 26, 2021 called tax the rich what does the bible say well, it's only been at the time of this writing this is what it says it's only been a week or two since the elite had their charity event now i got charity in quotes 
the Met Gala. One of the talking points of this event was a dress, a very pricey looking one at that. Worn by New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio or or Cortez that said in red letters, tax the rich. Ocasio-Cortez received backlash from pundits on both sides of the political spectrum, with conservative uh, talk show hosts like Steven Crowder, Glenn Beck, um, and really a bunch, I think just about everybody at The Blaze hit on this. Um, the dresses designer owed a 100000 in back taxes, and um, you even had um, more left-leaning hosts like... Um, HBO's Bill Maher, who pointed out that 65,000 of the over 8 million residents of New York, you get this, pay 51% of the state's taxes. Now, while both of these are great points, and they really are, both of those do need to be pointed out, neither really addresses the root cause of the issue. And that is classism. Now, before I elaborate, let me clarify. When I'm talking about classism, I am not talking about the social justice type of classism where they're dividing us between oppressor and oppressed, but I am literally talking about the classism that the social justice elite are using to divide the common people who stand in their way of power. You know what I mean? So they're looking at, um, rather, instead of saying, hey, we're the oppressed, we are, we, you know, all of that, what I'm saying is, I'm talking about the fact that they are a class of people who divides up their subclasses, mainly, and I was talking about this with a lady at a gas station the other day. We got to talking about this. They are literally dividing us. They're trying to get the lower middle class and the poverty level people in fighting each other while they grow richer. And that's what we're going to talk about. So um, as far as classism goes, this is what we have. As far as the classism goes, the society we find ourselves in is using a Marxist tactic known as the Hegelian dialectic. Now for those who are not familiar, um, we're going to try to find a graphic and update it to the article. To show how this works. Still haven't had the time to sit down and do that. So I apologize. Now. This tactic is designed to divide. That's that's literally the main goal. Of the Hegelian dialectic. That's the main goal of Marxism in general. Is to divide. And then seize power. So whether it's by race. By social status. Or by religion. Because that's what happened in places like Yugoslavia. In this case, we are dealing with a tactic designed to make the lower class resent a phantom wealthy class. When we're talking about lower class, we're talking about the poverty class. They're designed, they want them to hate a phantom wealthy class. That phantom wealthy class is the class right above them. That would be lower middle class, upper middle class, things like that. When in fact, there actually is a wealthy elite class, and it's people like Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, who are going into politics and from a place of the common people, and they're coming out millionaires. That's why you used to have Bernie tax the millionaires. And now that he is a millionaire, we got to tax the billionaires. We got people like Joe Biden. Joe Biden, so he does this... Uh, he does this, uh, his taxing thing, right? And, you know, the number's changed, and now, all of a sudden, now that he's trying to implement it, the number that he is looking to do is right over, uh, you know, it caps out right at above 400000 right? Do you know what the president's salary is per year? If you guess 400000 you're correct. So... It's designed to make them resent a phantom wealthy class. That would be any class that makes more than them. And it is constructed in the minds of the mainstream media media and political quote leaders. That's who constructs this. Now understand, this wealthy class that they're talking about, you know, this upper middle class that that that's supposed or lower middle class that's supposed to be the ones that get taxed. 
because, you know, they're the ones, they're the bane of society. This class doesn't exist. I think technically I'm considered lower middle class. I think. And if it was not for the grace of God, I would be struggling to get by. But God has provided all of my needs. And I give him all the credit for that. So, understand, uh, this is what I got. Understand this wealthy class does not exist. If they did, you wouldn't see people like Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders opining about taxing the rich. They themselves are extremely wealthy. It is all an act to divide the common people as the real wealthy elite seize power and steal our freedoms. Now, this is a lot of buildup. I, however, find it completely necessary to understand one simple fact, that this was all avoidable. Now, the church as a whole, you know, because there are some who actually teach that uh, what I'm about to show you, but the church as a whole has failed. We cherry-pick scriptures to preach on Sundays while ignoring the very scriptures that are needed to make, a last, to make lasting policy changes in this country. For example, what does the Bible say about taxing the rich? Well, I'm glad you asked. Exodus 30, 11 through 16. If you've got a Bible, turn it there. If you've got internet access, head over to Bible Hub. We'll give you just a second. Type, type that into the search bar. 11, uh, 30, Exodus 30, 11 through 16, King James. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them. When thou numberest them. So this is a census. And this is a census tax. This they shall give. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras. And half shekel shall be, uh, be the offering of the Lord. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above. Shall give an offering unto the Lord. Now, verse 15, pay special attention here because this is the key to answering this question about taxing the rich. Verse 15, the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than a half a shekel. When they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Now, keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that in a minute. To make an atonement for your souls. And that... And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Now, like I said, I've got this, and you can find all of this. You can find this entire article on coursecorrectionradio.com. Link will be in the show notes. That way you can read this for yourself. Now, let's go over that again because we need, really need to pay attention to verse 15. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less. Now, we need the reason we need to pay special attention to this is because there is a gospel principle here for us to learn. Notice that the father pointed out ahead of time. You know that that they shall not the rich shall not give more because to charge the rich. More seems like a natural and even a common sense solution. After all, they have more money. They can afford a little more to spare and give. However, there is a principle, like I said, that the Father is trying to teach us through this taxation or offering. And like the old days of who wants to be a millionaire, we're going to phone in a friend to help us get the answer to this underlying principle. And that friend is Matthew Henry. In his commentary on Exodus 30, 11 through 16, Matthew Henry says this, The rich were not to give more, nor the poor less. And he cites verse 15. To intimate that the souls of the rich and poor are alike precious, 
and that God is no respecter of persons. And he cites Acts 10.34 and Job 34.19. In other offerings, men were to give according to their ability, but this, which was the ransom of the soul, must be alike for all. For the rich have as much need of Christ as the poor, and the poor are as welcome to him as the rich. They both alike contributed to the maintenance of the temple service because both were to have a like interest in it and benefit by it. In Christ and his ordinances, rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker. The Lord Christ is the redeemer of them both. Proverbs 22, 2. The Jews say, quote, if a man refused to pay this tribute, he was not comprehended in the expiation. This tribute was to be paid as a ransom of the soul, that there might be no plague among them. However, they acknowledged that they received their lives from God, and that they had forfeited their lives to, to him, and that they depended upon his power and patience for the continuance of them, and thus they did homage to God of their to the God of their lives and de deprecated those plagues which their sins had deserved. So we have the law and the gospel. This is the full counsel of God taught through the census tax in Exodus. All right, let's pick back up where we left off. So This money was raised, this money that was raised was to be employed in the service of the tabernacle, verse 16. With it, they bought sacrifices, flour, incense, wine, oil, fuel, salt, priest garments, and all other things which the whole congregation was interested in. Note, those that have the benefit of God's tabernacle among, among them must be willing to defray the expenses of it and not grudge the necessary charges of God's public worship. Now, see, today, pastors teach that as the tithe, but that is not the tithe. It is a tax. It is a tax. And it's a tax that had to be offered up. But you had everybody paid the same. So... In a way, it was like a tithe, but a tithe was a tenth. So you have churches misapplying different scriptures in different places, and that is why the ch church is a train wreck, quite frankly. So note, those that, so we already read, Thus we must honor the Lord with our substance and reckon that the best laid out, which is laid out, it, out in the service of God. Money indeed cannot make an atonement for the soul. Now, this part is important. Money can indeed cannot make an atonement for the soul, but it may be used for the honor of him who has made the atonement and for the maintenance of the gospel by which the atonement is applied. And that's where Matthew Henry ends. So even in a simple census tax, the father was showing the gospel of Jesus Christ to come. He even lays down the principles forgotten about by later generations. God is not a respecter of persons. Once again, the church can't understand that because they don't know how to properly, um, they don't know how to apply proper exegesis to the text. And one of the ways you do that is you let Scripture interpret Scripture. If there is a, dr a difficult passage that needs interpretation, take Peter's dream in Acts chapter 10, of the unclean animals on the blanket, the church applies that as food. But it's not. It was applied to this principle that God is not a respecter of persons. The Jews mistakenly called Gentiles unclean. God said, call not common, or call not common what I have called clean, right? God never called this food clean, these animals clean. As a matter of fact, he said the opposite in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Peter later says, that um, God has shown me that all men are clean. God has taught me, I believe what he says, is God has told, showed me not to call any man common or unclean. So that was the principle he was trying to teach them. God is not a respecter of persons. We're all the same. But of course the church doesn't understand that because they apply these passages to what they want 
And therefore, when it comes to applying the Bible to public policy, well, of course we're doomed because the left has a status religion. They have a status religion. They worship the state. They worship the self. True Satanism. Because what did Satan do? He wanted Adam and Eve to uh, make themselves as gods, right? To basically worship themselves. You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, match that up with the division these wealthy politicians sow with their rhetoric of, quote, taxing the rich. All the while, they sit in Washington, D.C., getting richer by sowing discord and passing laws that benefit only them. Now, imagine, if you will, we're going to go Twilight Zone, imagine, if you will, a world where Christians made such a cultural impact because of our unwavering desire to preach the whole counsel of God. And that really would be like a Twilight Zone if that actually happened. But I would love it if it happened. This happened in Puritan England. So much so that the Puritans controlled the parliament under Oliver Cromwell. Taking back our nation isn't impossible. But it will require us to stop capitulating to the culture. Now... If you haven't, please read through the Old Testament as the roadmap that helps us be more Christ-like. I promise, when you do, it will change your life, and it will change the tide in this culture war. But the most important thing is do not take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Because I promise you, God's word is so much better than we have been taught. All right, let's move right into the next segment. We're going to go ahead and we're going to break down um we're going to break down the doctrine of lesser magistrates. So, um and I don't have it pulled up, so give me just a second. This is this is my bad. I've got the actual uh article we're going to read about the doctrine of lesser magistrates, but Let's pull up. Yeah, you know, you guys have seen it. You guys have seen it. Never mind. So you guys have seen the clip that we played, and if you haven't, go back and watch our Romans 13 video. Does Romans 13 mean that we should submit to the government? Um, Like, what is the actual... Is that about submitting to the civil government? Go watch that. Uh, There was a claim made in there about uh, by Todd Friel of Wretched Radio... And what he said was, he said that he didn't hold to the doctrine of lesser magistrates. Um, So we're going to read that. We're going to see. Let's test it and see if it's biblical. So this is the lesser magistrate doctrine, a sword against unjust edicts and tyranny by Pastor Matt Truhella. So many Americans seem to know that America's founders gave us three boxes through which we can resist tyranny, namely the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. But a lesser known tool with the founders themselves employed is the lesser magistrate doctrine. Simply put, the lesser magistrate doctrine declares that when a magistrate who is lower in authority than another higher authority opposes or and or resists the unjust orders of the laws of the higher authority, he is justified in doing so and his actions are morally right, proper, and legitimate. For example, if Congress or the president makes an unjust or immoral edict, a state legislator or the governor could stand in defiance of their unjust edict and refuse to obey or implement it. So in other words, our entire fabric of federalism is based off of the doctrine of lesser magistrates. They could, in fact, actively oppose it. Or, for that matter, a city council or mayor could act in defiance of or in opposition of an unjust edict by higher authority. The lesser, do- the lesser magistrate doctrine became important to Christian men during the Reformation, though it had been spoken of and practiced prior to that by Christians. For example, the Magna Carta was written by a group of barons, lesser magistrates, who had the tyrant King John of England sign it in the year 1215 at Runnymede, which is located southwest of London. 
This great doctrine, which stands in defiance of tyranny and oppression by making clear that the state has limitations and that are subject to the law, people and state officials alike, was penned by Christian men. Calvin spoke of the lesser doctrine, the lesser magistrate doctrine, and his institutes of the Christian religion. Amazingly, he did not appeal to scripture in his support of it. Rather, he appealed to pagan historical examples, which is one of the many reasons why I can't get behind. And I, I realize, I totally get the point that people say that uh, Calvinism is actually based off of some of his writings, but was actually put together by other people. Fine. I cannot get behind Calvinism, though, because of the things that John Calvin did. I just, I think he was just, I think he was pagan. I would think he was just too pagan. Honestly, really and truly, that's my opinion. I think he was too pagan. All right. So, but other reformers did give a scriptural foundation to the doctrine. John Knox, for example, in his appellation, written to the nobles of Scotland in 1558, cites many passages to support the doctrine. Knox wrote his appellation, which is his appeal, to the nobles because the Roman church had condemned him and burned him in effigy. He wrote to declare to the nobles as lesser magistrates their responsibility in protecting the innocent and opposing those who had made unjust decrees. Knox made it clear that it is the duty of the lesser magistrates to resist the tyranny of chief magistrates when the chief magistrate exceeds his... Ex now, get this, this. This is very important. Exceeds his God-given authority or actually makes declarations which are in rebellion to the law of God. He exhorts the nobles, the lesser magistrates, in his ap appellation, quote... You are bound to correct and repress whatsoever you know him, the higher magistrate, to attempt expressly repugning to God's word, honor, glory, or what you shall aspire him to do against his subjects, great or small. Now, some of the scriptures Knox cites to expound on the lesser magistrate doctrine are Daniel 3, which, as you know, is the story of uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael are commonly referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so uh, you, yeah, we're all familiar with that story. The king built an image, which if you look at the numbers around the image, the numbers are indicative of the image that will come with the uh, with the beast of Revelation 13. If you have not, you can find our Olivet Discourse mini marathon. And one of the things we talk about in our Understanding the Abomination Part Two, which you can find by itself, uh, also on our YouTube channel or on our podcast page. Um, you can um, you can find that in our uh, podcast page on our website. But like I said, you can also find it on our YouTube channel. Um, we talked about how we looked at Revelation 13, the Maccabees, and places like Daniel 3. Check that out if you need more information, because we're not going to read that passage for time. So, 1 Kings chapter 12, we'll go there. If you've got a Bible, you can flip to 1 Kings chapter 12. And I'm in Ezra, so I've got to do some more flipping. There we go. First Kings chapter 12. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came. And spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? 
And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto his people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. So be a benevolent king, was their advice. You know, lighten up. Take away some of the stuff your, their father did, because Solomon was a tyrant. Absolutely was a tyrant. A vile, wicked, evil tyrant. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Solomon, when you see that um, Masons and things like that, when you see Masons and things like that, and they talk about Solomon's temple, everybody thinks it's a good thing. This drives me nuts because Solomon was heavily steeped in dark occult magic, sacrificing children, things like that. The lot. Anyway, that's that's a different story for a different time. That's not what we're talking about today. The point is, Solomon was a tyrant. A vile, wicked, evil tyrant. So, and they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. Talking about Rehoboam. He forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. And which stood before him. And he said unto them, what counsel give ye that we may answer thy, this people who has spoken to me, saying, "Make the yoke which of thy father did, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter?" And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, "Thus shalt thou speak unto the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, <clears throat> but make it thou lighter unto us. Thou shalt say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins." Excuse me. Verse 11. And now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again yet the third day. And the king answered the people, Roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him, and spake unto them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite, Unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. For when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see, thine own ho- now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed from, uh, unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah... Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent, uh, sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get up to his chariot to flee Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Now there's more. The, the chapter goes on. But the point is, is that Rehoboam tried to become double, if not triple, the tyrant of his father, King Solomon. And because, and it said, get now get this, it said the Lord had willed it, right? Because we know that 2 Kings 11, if you read 1 Kings 11, the kingdom was rent from Solomon because of his wickedness. And this was the fruition of that. But understand that God allows his will to be through the actions and the free will choices of man. This is why I say I'm not a Calvinist. Because while I do agree in God's sovereignty and control over everything, I also believe that the way he accomplishes his will is through the total free will of man. Because he knows what's going to happen. And regardless of what we do, our decisions, his will will be done because he's seen it all already. Now, people will say, how can it be one or the other? I have no clue. But I know what the Bible says, and the Bible says that, you know, 
they're the perseverance of the saints. Now, Calvinists say that that means that, you know, you we get your salvation, you can never lose it. I don't believe that. That makes absolutely no sense. We'll get into that one day. Um, but the point is, is that regardless of where you're coming from, whether you're coming from the side of Calvinism or Arminianism, the thing we need to agree on right here is that when things like this happen, tyrants stand up. God is sovereign over all. He knows what's going to happen, but God's will, I truly believe, and I believe the scripture backs that up, and that's why we're going to break down some of these. God's will is that the people stand up to tyrants. I truly believe that because we're to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Now, we're going to get into it here in a few minutes because we're going to look at the power. Now, remember, we talked about this in our Romans 13. The exousias is the word used for higher powers there. So we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6 in a few minutes. But we're going to flip over to 2 Kings 11 before we do that because this is the next one that Knox cited. We're not going to read this entire um, lesser magistrate thing, although it's really not that long. So we might, just because I think that it's great, and I think you guys should read it as well. And um, we're going to look at Second Kings chapter 11. So this is Jehoash, king of Judah. So this is when, so actually we're not going to read this one. We're just going to break it down. So if you are not familiar with what is going on here, well, we'll read a little bit of it. Because, you know, regardless of this, we we need to take the time to read the scripture. So we might go a little long, but if that's okay with you guys... We'll, we'll go a little long. We'll see how it goes. And so when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, so Athaliah is the daughter of Jezebel, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. So she killed all the princes of Israel. But Jehosheba, the daughter of, the king, of king Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain, and they hid him, even even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain, and he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Athaliah did reign over the land. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds, and the captains, so the rulers, so we've got some, we've got some lesser magistrates here, Rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him in the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them saying, this is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. And a third part shall be at the gate of Sir, and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall ye keep the watch of the house, that it may not be broken down in two parts. Of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. All right, so basically there's a conspiracy here that is in a coup attempt. They're eventually going to try to take the kingdom back from Athalia. But they are showing active resistance in the form of uh, bearing arms. Now, I'm not one to call for violence. I need to make that very clear. That is not what this is about. This is about understanding what the Bible says because uh, my goal here, and it's not because I want to prove him wrong. I've got no stake in the matter. The fact is is that when Todd Friel talks about wearing pinwheels on the side of his head, he is um, actively in rebellion to God's word. Yes, that is a heavy, heavy claim to make, but that's what it is because he is not properly dividing the word of truth. And the, what, but what pisses me off about it is the fact that he doubled and even tripled down pulling out... Um, commentaries from John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, to to double down on his point. Now, keep in mind, John MacArthur, who I disagree with on a lot of stuff, but nevertheless respect because of the stand he took against the tyrants of California by not shutting down his church. Now, I don't think they went far enough because of their view of the doctrine of lesser magistrates. That's me, but the good news is they stood up, and I really believe, I really think that despite what he said, I think if it came down to tyranny like that, I think Todd Friel would stand up too, so I want to give him credit. However, 
When you are breaking down the Word of God, it is important to look at the whole counsel of God. And, you know, I get proper exegesis. You know, you want to look at the passage in its context. But the fact of the matter is, is that when Paul is talking about passages through the Bible, he is he is always referring and alluding to stories from the Old Testament. Always. So, um, there's other places that he references. 2 Kings 11, which we just talked about. Jeremiah 26, 39. 37, um, and uh, some more verses from 39. So the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine had a huge impact upon the thinking of our founders. Now, what I wanted to do was I wanted to read a couple because the Bible says, uh, out of the mouth are two or three witnesses shall truth be established, right? So that's a paraphrase, of course. But, um, and like I said, um, you know, if you guys have not seen it, I highly recommend going and listening to FOJC radios. The Father is not Amish because Brother David actually does a great job breaking down um, Romans 13 as well. And he uses even more examples such as, um, is it Othniel? Is that the judge that it was that stabbed the fat Midianite king and the knife disappeared? But that was a great one that showed that. So you have to take the whole counsel of God into effect to properly understand these things. Let's go on with the article. The Lesser Magistrate Doctrine had a huge impact on the thinking of our founders and upon our nation's people regarding the government and law. We, however, live in the midst of a statist, slave-like people where such thinking has long been forgotten. The magistrates themselves know nothing of this doctrine today because the pulpits have long been silent regarding it. Amen. They have. And that is, there is no excuse for that. No excuse. Dereliction of duty on the church is absolutely what has happened. If ever this nation needs to understand the lesser magistrate doctrine, it is now. Immoral and unjust edicts are commonplace. The preborn are being murdered and sodomy is being proliferated. The assault upon our freedoms and liberties is a daily undertaking by those in high office. The attacks upon the law of God are ferocious and relentless. In our nation today, the state has declared good to be evil and evil to be good. The lesser magistrate has a duty before God to uphold the good regardless of the new definitions created by the state. We must remember that all authority is delegated. No man holds state office. No man who holds state office rules autonomously. The authority has been delegated to him by God, which is what Romans 13 is about. Romans 13 is not only about how a Christian can be a good citizen, but how a ruler can be a good ruler. It is a two-sided coin. Hence, all those in positions of authority stand accountable to God. This is why the practice of the church historically has been when the state commands that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we have a duty to obey God rather than man. The Bible clearly teaches this principle. The lesser magistrate is to apply this principle to his office as magistrate. When an unjust edict is made by a higher authority, the lesser magistrate must choose to either join the higher magistrate in his rebellion against God or to stand with God in opposition to the unjust edict. As our nation sinks more and more into rebellion and depravity, the lesser magistrate doctrine needs to be taught more than ever. May the Lord grant us strength and favor to do so. (coughs) Amen. Amen. What a beautiful article. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to go into the side of the doctrine of lesser magistrates that I want us to focus on, and that is understanding the spiritual behind the physical. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, for those of you who may not um, have seen it, uh, Dan Badandi and I did a show together on his spiritual warfare show on the Dan Badandi show where we talked about spiritual warfare 101 and we broke down how the powers in the second heaven are delegated. Um, We tied it to some things in the book of Enoch and we talked about the millennial reign and how the deception of the millennial reign is, um, has hidden these things 
from the common Christian. And all of that ties into Romans 13 because the reality is is that spiritual warfare matters. And so um, we're going to have to end this here because we're coming right up on two hours. But, guys, and I don't want to go over for Now You See TV, but if you go to our bonus, if you go to the notes, there will be a bonus section with uh, our version of, there will be two bonus sections, one for the weekend news bulletin and one for this part of the show. And you can find those on coursecorrectionradio.com. We'll leave the links in the show notes. Y'all take care. Have a wonderful night, and we will see you in the bonus round that is exclusively on our website. God bless everyone, and good night. <laughs>